Um, let's get into some climate change news straight away. Uh, this is from Al Jazeera. I got this from Nick Humphrey's page. Global heating kills half the corals on the Great Barrier Reef. New research finds corals on vast Australian reef increasingly unable to recover from heat-caused bleaching. Unable to recover. Half the corals on Australia's Great Barrier Reef have died over the past 25 years, scientists said Wednesday, warning that climate change is irreversibly, meaning not being able to be reversed, irreversibly destroying the World Heritage listed underwater ecosystem. A study published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society Journal found an alarming rate of decline across all uh, sizes of coral since the mid-1990s on the vast reef that lies off the country's northeastern coast. Uh, larger species, such as branching and table-shaped corals, have been worst affected, almost disappearing from the far northern reaches of the reef. Researchers found they're typically de depleted by up to 80 or 90% compared to 25 years ago. Good Lord. 80 or 90%. Larger species, 80 to 90%. They make the nooks and crannies that fish and other creatures depend on. So losing big three-dimensional three -dimensional corals changes the broader ecosystem. Aside from the inestimable natural, scientific, and environmental value, the 2,300-kilometer-long Reef was uh, worth an estimated $4 billion a year in tourism re revenue. Oh, we, we definitely need that. I mean, we don't want to lose that. <clears throat> what are we going to do? Are we going to stop global warming so we can keep this $4 billion a year in tourism going on? Uh, is that what we're going to do? Estimated $4 billion a year in tourism revenue for the Australian economy before the coronavirus pandemic struck. <clears throat> Go coronavirus pandemic. Because down with tourism. The $4 billion a year in tourism is why the coral reefs are dying. <laughs> so, uh, yay, coronavirus. The reef is at risk of losing its coveted world heritage status because of ocean warming fueled by climate change, which is damaging its health. Changes in ocean temperature stress healthy corals, causing them to expel algae living in their tissues and draining them of their vibrant colors in a process known as bleaching. Back-to-back -back mass bleaching events in 2016 and 17 prompted the government to downgrade the long-term outlook for the world's largest living organism to very poor, quote-unquote. Mass bleaching was first seen on the reef in 1998, at the time the hottest year on record. <laughs> at the time, remember when 1998 was the hottest year on record? <laughs> You know those memes that say, like, uh, don't think of 2020 as the hottest year on record. Think of it, think of it as the coolest year in the next 20 years, <clears throat> right? So, you know, let's go back in time. Don't think of 1998 as the hottest year on record. Think of it as the coolest year in the next 20 years. But as temperatures continue to soar, its frequency has increased, making it harder for the reef to recover from each incident. The Big Mamas, a vibrant cor coral population, has millions of small baby corals as well as many large ones. The Big Mamas who produce most of the larvae. The study's lead author, Andy Dietzel, also, also of James Cook University, said, its resilience is compromised compared to the past because there are far few, fewer babies and fewer large breeding adults. On top of long-term ocean warming and associated bleaching, the reef has been battered by several cyclones and two outbreaks of crown of thorns starfish, which eat the coral since 1995. <clears throat> there you go. I'm going to move on from that story and go to this. Speaking of cyclones... Uh, dozens killed in floods across Southeast Asia as Tropical Storm uh, Nanka approaches. 
This is from yesterday. Cambodia has been uh, undergoing uh, undergoing some serious flooding. Nearly 40 people have died in Vietnam and Cambodia. Scores more were missing, including rescuers, due to prolonged heavy rain and flash flooding. As Tropical Storm Nanka edges toward the Vietnam, Vietnamese coast on Tuesday. Heavy rains since early October have caused deadly floods and landslides in several provinces in central Vietnam and displaced thousands of people in western Cambodia, officials and state media said. The floods are expected to worsen over the coming days. With tropical storm Nanka forecast to dump more rain as it makes landfall in Vietnam on Wednesday. Nanka packed wind speeds of up to 100 kilometers per hour will tr trigger heavy rain of up to uh, 400 millimeters or 16 inches in parts of northern and central Vietnam from Wednesday through Friday. Its weather agency said ongoing flooding has killed at least 28 people in Vietnam and 11 in Cambodia, where almost 25,000 houses and 84,000 hectares of crops have been damaged, according to local media. Vietnam Vietnamese disaster management authorities said over 130,000 houses have been impacted. 17 construction workers were missing following a landslide at the site of a hydropower dam pro project in the central Vietnamese province of Tua Tin Hua, or Hu, sorry, just not pronouncing that at all. <clears throat> State media reported. Uh, additionally, I heard that there were more storms in the area. Gene says, complete collapse of an ecosystem. I, I believe, uh, commenting on the Great Barrier Reef, yeah. Uh, just one moment. Uh, let's see. Uh, Yeah, hold on one second. I'm trying to see if I can find some information on these. Uh, Cyclones in the area. Yes, I guess there's a few other ones. Norbert. Sorry, I'm not really showing you this to you. I'm trying to find something a little more concise, but I'm having a difficult time doing it. Sorry, guys. Uh, let's see. Maybe I can just... Oh, dang it. God dang it. Anyways, I'm going to give up on that because Google is not always very helpful. But anyways, as we have discussed. Anyways, that's what I heard that there were, there were a few other cyclones possibly forming or threatening in the area. Um, let's move on. We have 101 watching 44 likes, please like up the video guys. Um, I'm going to read something from George Sacroclides. Something new. This is called A Plague on All Your Houses. It's from uh, October 11. 
The Slaves Revolt, Judgment Day for Our Modern Athenian Democracy. It is a sign of humanity's lack of intelligence that is, it has developed judicial systems based solely on its own survival and benefit. Our criminal, civil, and international laws draws up the Earth's boundaries, helps to equitably split up marriages, and defines a million types of ownership, quote-unquote, of land, resources, and, until recently, other people. <clears throat> the International Declaration of Human Rights is perhaps the most selfish Irrelevant and narrow accord of them all outlining in detail how all humans have an equal right to food, freedom, and education. I used to defend it passionately when I gave speeches against the death penalty in the days when I was heading up the Amnesty International team in my university. Not anymore, not because it was wrong, but because it is irrelevant. The International Decla Declaration of Human Rights is the equivalent of the rules of the Athenian democracy or even the British Parliament of the 18th century, all members of the democracy are equal as long as they are men, not slaves, and own large plots of land so they can qualify or to run for office. It excludes all others in the same way that our legal system excludes the rights and wishes of everyone else, quote-unquote, all of the other 8 million species that inhabit this planet and feed from the same pot that we do. If they all cease to exist... Our existence will be untenable and irrelevant, and this is not human law. It is nature's law. Religion functions in a very similar way to our judicial system. Having been nothing but a tool that served capitalism, racism, and the interests of the oligarchy in power under the guise of the search for salvation and equality. The very existence of the Pro Protestant church is down to Henry VIII wanting to divorce his wife. The Catholic Pope wouldn't allow him, so he, in, he invented a church that would. Belgian missionaries in King Leopold's Congo colluded with homicidal slave capitalists to further each other's interests. Right? Remember, remember that Holocaust? Uh, um, the number of something like 10 million or more people killed? Africans killed? Uh... It wasn't until the current year, 2020, that the king's statues were finally attacked. We are only beginning to uncover the filthy monstrosity of our so-called civilization that lies under the statues of our spiritual leaders. They are nothing but stinking turds gilded in gold, stolen violently from the Americas by the Spanish conquistadors. What our laws and religions still disregard to this day is that the other 8 million species on this planet also have the right to existence. Thank you. The right to their own land, their habitat. Thank you. The right to prosper and thrive. Thank you. They are the modern slaves of the Athenian democracy. They are the ones that have been paying far too high a tax all along. But we know very well what happened to the Athenian democracy and to the fake early British parliament. They imploded under their own arrogance or hubris, succumbed to devastating plagues, and were eventually reformed. So, a plague on all your houses, religion, capitalism, and the judicial system. Good stuff from George Sacraclides. Uh, yeah, I, right. I, I was just thinking this because I was... Again, thinking about our conversation, the conversation that we kind of touched on the other day about, you know, humans deciding the fate of humans or how, how long humans can live or how many humans can be born or how many, you know, whatever, how many resources humans can use. And I was thinking about the idea of, uh, you know, we're so intrigued, we're so uh, interested in crimes against humanity, but we don't think about crimes against nature. Um, and if we, well, you know, what is one of nature's directives? One of nature's directives is balance. And, you know, if, if a species overshoots, uh, there, you know, there's something, a natural law called, you know, balance that takes out species that overshoot 
um, their resources, right? So um, we are we have been going against nature's balance for a very long time. <laughs> on some level, we have been operating against the laws of nature. We have been, and you know, on many levels, committing crimes against nature because we're operating against the laws of nature, right? So I'm not going to go down this road for too long. I'm just saying, just, you know, our knee-jerk ideas about humanitarianism and what it means to be human or anthropocentric or, you know, having dominion over all the earth and all the species, right? Our do you, our, all of our ideas around that are fairly, fairly shoddy, I would propose. But anyways, and I don't care if you disagree. If you do disagree, that's fine. Let's talk about it. But, you know, I'm not going to stop talking about it because you disagree. Oh, my God. Why are we having this conversation? Oh, yeah. Blah. Um, I am Sweet Leaf says we are programmed to knee jerk, I think. Yes. <laughs> or just programmed to jerk. Programmed to programmed jerks. But yes, you know, uh, the my title Hubris Sapiens is, you know, obviously we believe that we are the greatest, the bestest, the one most wonderful, we are the smartest, we are the um we are the brightest, we are the wisest, right, sapiens. And nature might have other ideas about that in the long run. And if we don't listen, if we don't like sit down and be quiet and go, huh, nature, what's that you say? Huh? Oh, oh, okay. Well, I didn't really want to hear that. So goodbye. Click. Um, yeah, we don't want to hear what nature is trying to tell us, which is, Maybe you guys should sit, sit down <laughs> for a while. Coronavirus actually was nature's way of telling us to sit down for a while. And we're just assuming that it's, we're, we're just taking it on face value that it's naturally made and occurred in nature and was released by wild bats or something. Um, Jeff But uh, Butelier says we are Homo calidus, the clever ape. Yes, I like Homo hubris or <laughs> hubris sapiens. <laughs> Maybe hubris and sapien is an oxymoron, right? Because it's hubris that's wise hubris. So maybe I messed it up there. Maybe it should be Homo hubris. Sorry about that. Now that I'm thinking, now that I'm thinking about that. Um. Lowy Lowy Appet says I've just read Darwin's Dangerous Idea by Dennett. Nature will not cause a Malthusian equilibrium? No? Okay. I don't know. Well, let's move on. I don't want to get I don't want to get stuck in a discussion today. <laughs> not that I don't enjoy the discussions. I just don't want to get stuck there today. I got I got a lot to cover and I don't have a lot of time today. Um, where am I? Yes. Here is an interesting article in Medium uh, by someone named Brad Zarnett. This is from October 9th. Sucking up to business is a certain path to ecological... Collapse, sucking up to business, you say? You mean like taking our cues from billionaires and trillionaires? That's not a good idea, you say? Uh, Playtime is over. We have a broken system that encourages business to destroy rather than to regenerate and protect. Well, you know, I'm going to go one farther and say that business, there, there are very few businesses that operate on that model of regeneration and protecting. Why? Because it's not, it's not profitable. <laughs> so, 
on some levels, regenerate and protect are the antithesis of business, but whatever. We'll just keep going. Uh, this looks like it might be long. I'm just going to read a little bit of this and then move on. Part one, responsibility. In a recent conversation with a p fellow sustainability strategist, oh, it was suggested that the efforts of sustainability and CSR professionals, while not perfect, are based on good intentions. That got me thinking. Are good intentions enough? What if those intentions are constrained from within <clears throat> A corporate culture that uses a self-serving interpretation of climate science pr to protect a lucrative but ecologically destructive business model. Oh, what if? From within that type of culture, how can good intentions of a dedicated sustainability professional possibly emerge? Uh, really good question. Hold on one second, guys. I want to I wanna get into this a little more, but... um. Just trying to check my. My bad. Let me go back. Uh, what are they to do? What's the responsibility of a sustainability <clears throat> professional who knows that their employer or client is using their wealth and corporate influence to mislead the public? with an alternative environmental reality? Oh, oh my, that's a good question. One that downplays the urgency to act and where half measures and inconsequential efforts are spun as meaningful. These are rather good questions that this, this fellow is acting, asking today. If the climate clock wasn't ticking, maybe it wouldn't matter, but it is. And once we pass the threshold, there's no going back or starting at a new normal. It will be a steady descent into systems failure, food scarcity, political chaos, and suffering. Positive versus meaningful. There are two types of progress in the battle to protect our climate, positive and meaningful. And the distinction is crucial. <laughs> yes. A positive result is one that no matter the degree, environmental harm is reduced. A giant clothing company that switches to organic thread would be considered to have made a positive change. Proponents of this approach will praise the incremental effort and assert how every little bit helps, or at least that it's a positive step that can be built on. <clears throat> like, you know, join, joining the Paris Accord. Those responses ignore our looming reality. A meaningful result is different. It could be described as a dramatic reduction or the complete elimination of harm being unleashed on an ecosystem and transferring harm from one place to another that is slightly less harmful is not a win and certainly not meaningful. I'm hard pressed to find any sizable corporation that operates in this way other than everyone's favorite Patagonia and possibly Ikea. Really? Hold, hold on now. Hold on now. Anyways, uh, um, I, I'm looking, I've got, I've got one raised eyebrow, I got another raised eyebrow, I got two raised eyebrows on that statement. But anyways, but these corporations are still causing far too much harm considering the desperate climate challenge that lays before us. Yes. And that is the reality. And the closer you look, the more disturbing it becomes. Let's look closer, shall we? 20 or 200 times worse, more, more than most. People involved in sustainability understand the science of climate change and that our carbon budget <clears throat> uh, will expire in less than 10 years if it isn't already expired. Furthermore, they also likely understand that continuing to degrade ecosystem, ecosystems will only make matters worse. Today's heat waves, droughts, forest fires, and floods are not a new normal. It's a stark warning of our slide into climate chaos and large-scale global suffering. One degree of warming will become two, and then three. And we need to clearly understand that two is not twice as bad as one. It could be 20 or 200 times worse. This man is spitting truth. <clears throat> Positive feedback loops are nearly impossible, impossible to predict, 
but their impacts are coming and they will shake every life supporting ecosystem on the planet. Let me go back to meaningful, positive change versus meaningful change. <clears throat> For just one moment, meaningful change would be closing down your business altogether. Closing down or, or uh, engaging in making, you know, just enough, right? Just essential things for people at whatever minimal profit that might be and calling it a day, that would be meaningful impact. Anyways, the real world, if we could do anything we want to make the world a better place, I'm sure that each of us would have dozens of ideas. But for now, let's come down from the clouds and explore this challenge from the real world. Let's assume that internally, uh, a sustainability professional is using all their skills and influence to lobby for positive change. That's a good start. But the harsh truth is that in most cases, they're fighting a losing battle. Their voice is lost in a sea of pro-profit sentiment. At bonus time, most companies reward employees based on increasing profits. Exactly. That's the, what I was saying at the beginning, which is that uh, it's antithetical to uh, business making profits, the planet, saving the planet. Not on reducing environmental harm or building a new, less harmful business model that has new costs associated with it. If you know of a company that significantly rewards employees based on meaningful sustainability metrics, then please let me know. <laughs> I get it. You need your job. You need to provide for yourself and your family, and you may even be paying off student debt. <clears throat> and that's where they got you because now you're a slave. Ultimately, you're a slave to the system, student debt. I, I had to get this degree to get a really good job, and now I really got to have this really good job because uh, I got to pay off my debt, and uh, shoot, I don't know what to do. I can't get rid of it. I can't declare bankruptcy because Joe Biden uh, changed the laws. Thanks, Joe Biden. Changed the laws. I can't declare bankruptcy. I'm stuck. I'm yoked to this d debt. <laughs> oh, Ultimately, you're tied to the system. We all are. If you speak out, you may get alienated at work or you could even get fired, which would make it very tricky to get another job. But I really need this job. I really do. Utilizing your special skill set. Although in some cases, it might be the perfect resume builder. To some degree, this is all true. So you don't call out your company or client. And instead, you convince yourself that you're doing some good from within. <clears throat> but is that really true? Can you really fight against predatory, a predatory system that is ruled by short-term profits and ecological destruction by working with a company that strives to achieve short-term profits and ignores ecological destruction? <laughs> and once again, please don't tell me how every little bit helps or how at least it's a positive step which we can build on. Those responses ignore our looming reality. And, and Damn, I like this guy. Damn, I like this article because... You know, just doing a little bit doesn't necessarily think, mean that you're doing anything at all or anything meaningful on any level. But you're, it, as long as you're signaling that you're doing something, that's fine. Let's use Coca-Cola as an example. Leadership at Coca-Cola. This is a great article. This summer, Coca-Cola Europe announced the replacement of plastic for six packs with the can, collar, paperboard packaging solution. All right. Coca-Cola considers this a sustainable and recyclable uh, solution that is set to keep more than 18 tons of plastic from ending up in the world's oceans each year. This might sound impressive, but keep in mind that Coca-Cola is the largest plastic polluter is the largest plastic polluter in the world and produces 3 million tons of plastic packaging each year. So while 18 tons might sound like a lot, it's actually just a tiny fraction. It's a tiny fraction of all the plastic they produce. Eighteen out of three million is a reduction of just point zero zero six percent. Point zero zero six percent. Did y'all get that? Framed honestly as a relative reduction, these the efforts of Coca-Cola are inconsequential at best and misleading at worst. 
Perhaps this is why Coca-Cola spends approximately $4 billion each year on advertising. Hold on one second. I got to check my flow. Oh, no. My flow is no. Hold on one second, guys. All right. It's coming back. Coming back. Or not. All right, let's go back to this. There is essentially no meaningful regulation on plastic pollution, or carbon for that matter. And regardless of what Coca-Cola says about sustainability, sales come first before societal and environmental well-being. Boom. He just said <laughs> the absolute bottom line, the, the truth, which is the bottom line, is the only truth they care about. The only thing they care about and the environment be damned. According to their longtime director of sustainability, B. Perez, or B. Perez, getting rid of the plastic bottle is a non starter as it could alienate customers and hit sales. Oh no. Hmm, sounds a lot more like the director of marketing than sustainability. In effect, Coca Cola is saying that they refuse to change their business model in a way that tr could dramatically reduce their use of plastic and they're blaming it on their customers. Ooh, I love it. Three card Monty of sustainability of greenwashing guys. We're going to, we're going to um, take off the little plastic, you know, holder thing, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to, you know, do it with cardboard and we're going to slap a go green sticker on there and everybody's going to think we're doing sustainability right. <clears throat> I suppose that if a company doesn't have to pay for the harm that they cause and they have no real moral compass for societal well-being, then it makes sense to lobby against any meaningful change and resist finding a new way to sell their product. I can understand why those employed at Coca-Cola would gush over these meaningless efforts, but what about the rest of us who don't work there and who can see this whole charade for the hoax that it is? What's our responsibility to the truth? Is there harm in providing a little vis visibility for yourself by posting a trite congratulatory platitude on social media? It may only be a quick comment, but it's dangerous. It gives energy to a deceptive tactic and creates confusion and dialogue where none should exist. But perhaps even more insidious is that it pacifies us. It makes us think that someone else is on the job tackling climate change, and that's dangerous because it lulls us into a state of complacency. When instead, we should be out in the streets demanding change. Damn it, Brad. This is good stuff. Is that the guy's name? Brad. Brad Zarnett. Great stuff, Brad Zarnett. At this point, it might be helpful to reflect on exactly what drives a corporation to behave the way it does. Simply put, they are sociopathic entities that exist in an increasingly deregulated economic system that entices them to exploit people and resources in their quest to accumulate as much capital, capital as possible. Unless you think that corporations can be reasoned with or coaxed to do better, then placating them is not the answer. Ouch! Can we have a ding, ding, ding for Brad? And knowing that you're, you're encouraging comments could be doing more environmental harm than good is probably reason enough to stop doing it. Stop, stop encouraging the greenwashing. Hey guys, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and you can support the channel 
Uh, the link's below, uh, PayPal, Patreon, Square. Uh, also, if you'd like to watch the live streams, you can watch the live streams on my Patreon channel. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar. Um, so hopefully I will see you over there, and thanks so much.